Okay, so basically where we left off things last time, we talked about the neural elementary ranking algorithm, and that was an end-to-end -end approach for doing coreference resolution, which is the task of finding all the all the mentions in the uh, text. And we said mentions are usually noun phrases, pronouns, or proper names. And after we had found all possible mentions by automatically in a data-driven fashion, then uh, we had another like uh, set of layers which decided which of the uh, span pairs, excuse me, mention pairs are actually gonna be, um, um, you know, uh, have a coreference uh, relationship between uh, them and which do not. So now. Um, I kind of want to mention also how do we evaluate coreference resolution. Um, and I said we want, you know, we, we, we will have a set of evaluation measurements here, basically. So uh, in any case, we need the human annotated data. So we need the data where some human annotators has always has said, okay, these are the true mentions and these are the coreference uh, links between them. And then whatever we have produced by our model is going to be called reference chain. As always, we use this terminology reference versus um, versus uh, excuse me uh, hypothesis. And I, I, excuse me, I said um, I, I made a mistake. I I said that the we call the uh, uh, the generated uh, chains, uh, reference chains, that's not true. The hypothesis chains are those produced by a system and the gold uh, chains, human annotated one are reference chains. And remember when I told you that in uh, NLP conferences that come with these shared tasks and um, and I mentioned that in 2012, there was a Connell shared task that was all about uh, co-reference resolution. And uh, this uh, shared task proposed a couple of uh, measurements, such as MUC F1 measure, which is based on the number of uh, coreference links common to the Boyd hypothesis and reference chains. So you check where for every single uh, one of uh, chains you have predicted, uh, you check the precision and recall of those. So for example, precision is the number of common links divided by the number of links in the uh, hypothesis. Um, um, chain. Uh, B23 is based on the number of mentions, uh, uh, not number of uh, coreference links. So uh, the idea is the same. Uh, precision is the number of uh, mentions that are common to the reference and to the hypothesis divided by the number of mentions in the hypothesis chains. And then there is something called CAF, which I, it's, it's not important. I mean, it's important, but I won't describe it. And uh, what in the end you do, you take the average of these uh, three measurements. So when you see coreference F1 score, that means that we average these three different F1 score that we have computed in a different way. And um, you should be using reference implementation for these things. These things are very finicky to implement correctly. And you should be using whatever it has already been proposed with the Connell 12 sh uh, share task. Do not try to implement your own um, measurements for this. It's gonna be hard and um, yeah, there in, in the past many mistakes have been made because of this and that brings you, you know, gives you either wrong comparisons or wrong conclusions. Are there any questions about uh, co-reference resolution? Also, I don't see anyone. Um, so, you know, um, just once in a while, it would be good to hear something just to know I'm not talking to myself, which is the experience I have when I don't see anyone. <laughs> All right. So assuming you hear me and assuming you, this is clear, I'm gonna, gonna move on. Um, so um, you remember when we talked about semantic role labeling and then I told you for a while, like things were very, you know, slow. The progress was really, really kind of almost constant seeming. Um, and then after um, neural end-to-end -end approaches have come to the you know stage, things have improved drastically. And this is something we have also observed with the coreference resolution. So this a model that we have learned about last time, end-to-end -end coref, um, that's uh, you know that's uh, over here, 
um, you can see how much progress there has been. Uh, first, you know, uh, here we have a big jump. And also remember that here now we don't need any kind of handcrafted, manually designed features. So the, the process becomes simpler. And um, you can see once we had pre-trained uh, word embeddings um, and contextualized word embeddings like Elmo and Bird, how how big of these improvements are. So something from, you know, we went from, let's say, 67 F1, these average F1 of those three um, different F1 measurements to, you know, here almost 80. So, and then now we also have sequence to sequence approaches to this, which is, uh, again, remember when I was telling you how it's, um, it's kind of like, um, this is basically a clustering task, which we are approaching in this binarized way with sequence to sequence and Disappointedly, it works, right? It's it's this F1 score is really high over here. Um, so yeah. Um, it, it's, 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 oh, excuse me. Okay. Um, I does anyone have something to add or? Okay, uh, so that was probably just a mistake. Um, so what I was saying <laughs> retrospectively, I wish when I talked about pre-trained language models at the beginning of the course that I showed you these graphs, because this is quite impressive, right? To go from like 65 to eight, almost 85, 20% F1 score improvement in the span of, you know, from around 2017 to 2023. So hopefully this impresses you too, because it's major. Um, I'm going to move on um, to to another topic, which is gender bias in co-reference. And hopefully, like I, 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 in the end, because we have these shifts of the uh, schedules and everything, I'm going to cram a lot in one lecture where I want to talk about, you know, your bias and um, safety and explainability and all of those things, uh, which I'm the reason why I'm here out of town uh, is uh, to talk about those topics. So um, at least this being out of town prepares me well for for that. Uh, lecture so it's going to be a little bit crammy but uh, we're going to talk more about these topics and uh, I mean gender bias we mentioned I, I didn't talk too much about it when we talked about word embeddings and how there are these stereotypical associations that these uh, word embeddings kind of um, you know capture for example that uh, what is diva to a woman is a superstar to a man or uh, funny examples like uh, cupcakes are associated with women and pizzas with men why i don't know why that would be um so also with the uh, co-reference resolution it's had gender bias has been widely studied um so um, for example, here we have this uh, uh, a test, uh, we have these sentences, the physician hired the secretary because he was overwhelmed with clients. And then here, the, uh, the physician hired the secretary because she was overwhelmed with clients. You want to see whether your highly performing for reference resolution system can uh, resolve both of these, or it can resolve these correctly only when we have a uh, pronoun uh, he uh appearing over here and when the pronoun is she it connects it uh to secretary instead of the physician because those are the associations that the model had learned uh, uh about prototypical um professions for certain genders and what people always observe here is that there is um there is the um of course <laughs> what you might expect knowing that i wrote gender bias here is that uh, the model is better performing when it needs to resolve uh, these kinds of sentences where we it can exploit the associations, stereotypical associations it has learned. And, you know, classic question here that comes is like, okay, the data is biased, so the models are biased and that's it. It's just a reflection of the world. And um, that um, is actually... Uh, it's not only that, they amplify these biases. So uh, uh, there is... Um, um, this nice paper that I will open for just a moment. Uh, men like shopping too. Um, <clears throat> all right. So um, in this, uh, this is this is one of these classic papers that have shown that uh, if you had certain, um, I'll, I'll just see whether they have the measurements here. Um, 
no, they, they don't have a nice uh, slide. But at the point in this paper is that uh, if you had, let's say, uh, cooking uh, being 33%, uh, um, uh, you, you have a data set of images and uh, the task is to uh, predict the, um, um, you know, uh, gender, um, it, which is in itself problematic from these uh, images. And uh, these images show different actions like, uh, let's say, cooking or doing something else. And in this data set, the cooking action, 33% uh, of the images are associated with uh, men. You can see a male person um, or, you know, the, 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 the person's uh, gender is suggested to be male. And uh, other time we see a woman. And then um, when we train a model on this data and we uh, later on check the how many times uh, the, uh, the model had predicted that there is a woman when there is an action of cooking, uh, this uh, ratio will now become uh, way larger. So from, you know, let's say... Um, um, 60 something percent, it will go become larger. I, I don't have exact quantity here, but you can imagine going it from 66 to let's say 75 percent. So, what happens is models learn these associations and then make more of it and use it more uh, than what the data initially has suggested. So, this is called amplification of bias, which is, uh, of course, not something we want. Um, and then we talked about RLA Jeff and Arlevi Jeffs to some extent recommend some of the explicit overt biases, then but doesn't do so well on covert biases. And that's something again we'll come back at the end of the uh, course. But yeah, want to mention this um, because it's a it's a well studied uh, problem uh, in um, in a coreference resolution. Machine translation is another task where uh, gender bias is commonly studied too. All right, any questions about that? see a chat okay okay guys you need to talk to me because um <laughs> uh this this is a bit strange to to not see anyone or hear anyone so um yeah with that i want to move to another topic so i want to wrap the reference resolution here and i want to talk about uh, the concept of probing so um thanks thanks uh that's that's useful uh okay so um so we have spent a couple of weeks uh on talking about uh linguistic structure prediction we started with uh predicting parse trees, then we talked about semantic, semantic parsing, shallow semantic parsing, like semantic row labeling. We have now talked about a task of coreference resolution, which is also related to semantics. And um, But the first part of the course was spent on pre-trained language models. And, and you know, uh, a reasonable question could be like, why, um, like, I, I you know, it, you might now be convinced that to do all the sorts of the tasks we are interested in, like question answering and summarization and whatnot, you need to have this level of understanding of linguistic structure. You know, remember when we were looking at um, difficulties and ambiguities in parsing, and then we see uh, so the problem with PP attachments and all sorts of other uh, structural ambiguities. Um, yeah, pre-trained language models need to handle those, right? And it seems like they are handling them because they are doing things well. So. Uh, one thing that you might, you know, hypothesize is, well, do they then capture this notion of what the structure is and other aspects of linguistics that are needed to solve tasks? And this is the question that uh, NLPers have been asking themselves since, you know, post births around 2018. This question became very mainstream uh, in our, in our um, field. So um, I'm going to use slides I, you know, presented uh, a while back. Um, and um, yeah, so just wanted to shift to the other, other slide deck. But uh, so th this is the question of probing. So initial hypothesis of probing, uh, this is in words of John Hewitt, who is one of the people who have uh, contributed a lot in this area. So your hypothesis is, I think my representation learner, so your pre-trained language model, unsupervisedly, meaning without us explicitly supervising it to do so, so without labeled data, 
develop the notion of linguistic property I, for example, develop the linguistic, um, an, a notion of what the dependency relations between words are. And it co encodes this notion in its intermediate representation in order to better perform the task. It was trained on like language modeling. Okay, so this is something that's really hard to test uh, directly. So there is a there is a technique that emerged that serves as a proxy. But let me stop here and just see whether there are any questions about this hypothesis. Okay, I assume that there, there is not. So um, how can we go about testing this? Whether your model had now had learned to capture implicitly some notion of any kind of linguistic property. And this is the probing workflow. Um, you are gonna take your pre-trained language model. For example, you are going to take BERT and you're going to freeze it. So you freeze its parameters. You do not change it, change them. That's what we mean. And you are interested in certain specific linguistic property. Let's say we are interested in part of speech tagging. We are interested whether a model, um, when we get a representation, you know, of a token at the end of the, you know, after the final encoder block, um, we are interested in whether some notion of part of speech tag is captured in this highly dimensional, you know, 768 dimensional vector whose dimensions we do not understand. So, all right, you decided I'm going to test whether there is part of speech tag in my uh, representation. And then you are going to define a probing task for assessing understanding of this linguistic property. Now, you know, I, I introduced uh, part of speech tagging and we have learned the part of speech tagging task. Um, you might be interested in a linguistic property for which maybe there isn't well-defined task yet and you need to figure out how are you gonna, you know, define it? Um, maybe, for example, just to tell something uh, here. Maybe you're interested whether your model captures the notion of negation, and here you need to decide well how exactly am I gonna probe whether, you know, what's what what instance of a negation related task will I define here? But we have part of speech tagging as a task, right? That we know of, given a. A word, we want to predict it's a part of speech tag category in a given sentence. And then this step this is important. So the idea here is that with probing, you are going to define some simple probing model to solve the probing task, which is for us part of speech tagging. And um, simple is important here uh, because you don't want this model to have a lot of capacity in a sense that um, it has so many weights, it can learn the task from the representation. And it's not because the representation captures anything about part of speech tags, it's because uh, later we will give data to the simple probe and it had learned the task on its own. Um, so usually people here use a linear, simple linear layer atop of a frozen contextualized word representation. And you will need some data um, to supervise this simple task. And yeah, so what you're gonna do to put the things together here in step uh, six, you take the, um, you put your sentence through, let's say bird. At the end of the bird's representation, you get the contextualized word representation. And you are then you take those representation and you can imagine you are storing them either in a matrix or a complete separate data structure and you forget about your pre-trained language model you don't care about it anymore you just needed the representations out of it and now you you know implement a whole other linear model which now since you are all more familiar with torch that's just going to be a few lines of code like torch and then linear with certain dimension and then you give these contextualized word representations as the input to this linear layer. And the output should be the prediction of uh, which part of speech tag that is. So everything kind of stays the same with what you know, except that you are not um, using um, all the layers that uh, transform the layers uh, anymore. You don't care about them. Uh, and then um, 
if you manage to train this simple linear model just from these contextualized word representations, then we say, well, uh, this is good. It's likely that these contextualized word representations are predictive of the linguistic property required for solving the pre-training task. And otherwise, it's hard to draw conclusions because um, we can't really tell whether there is something wrong about our probe or the uh, property is not really encoded. So this technique gives us just information of whether something is encoded. Otherwise, we get kind of inconclusive results. All right, so I said a lot, um, and I'm not sure whether it's clear what are we doing here, so I'll stop and see whether you have any questions about this. I have a question. Yes, go ahead. So you said the probe is simple because you don't want it to learn, you don't want it to learn the part of speech itself, and you wanted to test the the model that you have already? Yeah, exactly. So the idea is that your representation of the uh, any token that you're interested in has captured potentially the part of speech. So that's the hypothesis we have here, that at the end, this representation is, is just capturing this notion of part of speech tag. And you want a mapping from representation to information of whether it's the part of speech is encoded or not. And this linear layer serves you as a way to kind of um, say to us in a way like very vaguely to translate whether there is part of speech encoded or not. So because the uh, we deem that these uh, linguists so we deem that doing this task like part of speech tagging or, or whatever version uh, here we define is too complex to be learned just by a linear model. That's an assumption we are making. So um, the ability for a linear model to do the task well just from the contextualized word representation and data is what researchers claim to be uh, the reason uh, to you know conclude that the, the, the property was encoded in the representation itself it's not the linear model that uh, was able to solve this uh, on its own. Does this make sense? Yeah, thank you. Great. Yeah, that's an important point to figure out, like this assumption, right? That the simple probe, um, and it, it's a big assumption, right? So uh, if you feel unconvinced, well, that's that's okay because um, it is it is an, an assumption that is kind of um, you know, um, maybe you disagree with, yeah. All right, so to go over everything one more, it's again, like we might uh, have a notion that certain property is encoded in the representations. So we get the representations, but we ditch the other layers that have produced the representation. And we are just testing whether the representation has information we are interested in. To do that, we need a simple model at top of that representation. So representation is an input to this simple model. And we train this model in a supervised fashion. Um, and um, and if the model is you know, doing well, we say, well, then these contextualized word representations are the predictive of this linguistic property. Now, this is how, how probing has kind of emerged on a scene. And since then, it has changed quite a lot because this idea of um, it should be a simple probe, um, it's it's a slightly dissatisfactory because you might still deem a simple model, like a linear model, uh, to be quite powerful if you start with a very good representation, which is, I don't know, it becomes like a circular uh, argument to me. Uh, like if you say, well, it is a simple a linear model is really good. If the representation is really good, then it kind of, it's very similar sounding to saying, well, if the property is encoded there in the representation, then you can do this. Um, but people have investigated other ways of doing that, that circumvents needing to train anything because that's the issue, right? Um, if you can just check whether something is in representation without training another model, that becomes better. And um, and also, um, 
uh, here, why when we have linear probe, we are assuming that the relationship is linear. So uh, this is also why we can't say anything about if the performance is low. Maybe you need, maybe it's um, you can retrieve information of whether something is encoded, but to retrieve that information, you need a non-linear mapping. So uh, this is also why poor performance here kind of is um, giving us inconclusive results. So the field has, uh, you know, I said this started in 2018, but uh, it became really massively active. Uh, and I recommend struggling to read this uh, survey by Jonathan Belinkov uh, that uh, shares different ways how people went about trying to probe whether something is encoded in the representation and, um, and also many shortcomings of these approaches because, um, yeah, they are not really causal and that then your conclusions are always slightly, they, 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 they are useful, but um, they, they always might be wrong because you don't have strong uh, guarantees. Okay, um, so let's move forward. So uh, first step, you know, we would ask ourselves in 2018, which pre-trained mask or not mask language model. And these were the options at the time. Um, what do you want to test these, you know, each one of these references is a reference to um, to a, a probing, uh, to a probing paper. So you can see that already in 2018, there were so much work, 2018, 2019, so much work trying to see what is encoded in the representation. And, you know, the today you can use any of these on any of your favorite language models. It's a, uh, it's a, um, as, as long as you can get a vector representation, um, you can do probing. Uh, what are the properties and tasks people have explored in all these papers? Um, so the the there is like this um, important distinction between what is a downstream versus a probing task. Um, downstream tasks are said to be too complex to firmly say what linguistic information uh, captured by uh, contextualized word representation was necessary to solve them. If I didn't mention before, this uh, abbreviation is for contextualized word representation. So those are representations that come from transformer-based models that have self-attention and uh, representations are becoming contextualized. Um, so for example, summarization or question answering or translation, that's com too complex to say whether it's, um, you know, uh, like I don't know what that what what would it mean to say question answering is encoded in a representation. So very often, what categories of probing tasks people looked into are what's more connected to this linguistic structure prediction that we talked about, such as uh, certain token labeling, like part of speech tagging, or uh, segmentation, like name identity recognition, or pairwise labeling, like relation extraction, um, which can be also, um, for example, the predicting dependencies between two, um, uh, two uh, excuse me, words. Uh, span labeling, I mentioned seg uh, for segmentation and data recognition. Name data recognition is both segmentation and span labeling because you're, you know, you're chunking the text into these are named entities or not, but also you're giving a label to each one of the named uh, entities, uh, whether it's a person or organization. Uh, and then there is a whole class of structure prediction task and semantic role labeling is an example of structure prediction. For example, we said, well, if we had used um, this span to be an argument of a certain word, a subset of it cannot be also an argument of that word. Um, okay, so I will go over uh, a few of these one, uh, by, one by one. So, um, which is a good way to uh, remind ourselves of all of these tasks. So um, maybe something I didn't emphasize enough uh, when I was here, specify a linguistic property. So I, I, I said part of speech tagging and then I said part of speech tagging. A better way would be to say, well, you are interested in whether a model had uh, understanding of basic syntactic information. And then you say, well, to know basic syntactic information, a model should have, uh, un, you know, should be able to do part of speech tag. But it should capture the notion of part of speech tag. Re remember when we did syntactic parsing in, a way, in the end? 
part of speech tags were the 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 lowest level. So we know that part of speech tagging is uh, the task of labeling a word in a given sentence with this part of speech tag, which is like noun, verb, adjective, whatever. And here we have an example sentence, Winken, 61 year old. Now imagine our contextualized word representation word on the word level tokenizer, which they do not. Uh, then what we would do is uh, for each one of these words, the Winken, 61 uh, years old, um, we would uh, get the contextualized word representation. So how do we get this? Well, we pass this tokenized sentence into let's say BERT and the final layer between the you know prediction layer uh, is a contextualized uh, representation of each one of these words. You might wonder, well, you are telling us, Anna, to imagine these are words, but they are not words, they are tokens. So what do I do then? And I, I think I mentioned a couple of times kind of heuristics that people deploy in this space then. Uh, for example, first word is very commonly used or you can, excuse me, representation of the first token uh, is commonly used if the word is split into multiple tokens or you can average the to uh, the representations of every token that makes up the word. Uh, and that's why keeping uh, information about word boundary is important. Remember when we talk about BPE, then we said, okay, uh, we respect word boundaries and then you can actually retrieve uh, the you know, information of whether something is a sub word or of a larger word. Um, BERT uses a word piece tokenizer, which we didn't talk much about, and it kind of delimits the, if uh, if a subword is a part of another word, and it's not the first token in this word, it's going to start with this special uh, little hashtag sign. So there is always a way to know that a subword is a part of bigger word, and then you can recompose back the um, uh not recompose, excuse me, you can calculate the vector, a uh, single vector for a word by doing some kind of arithmetics over the representations of the subwords that make up that word. Is Was that clear? I kind of, that, that was a lot of word I just said that, you know, I don't have uh, really anything up in the slide about that exact point. How do we uh, recombine, uh, how do we combine token representation to get the word representation? So yeah, let me know if that's not unclear. I will stop for a second. All right, so it seems like that's clear. So uh, let's go back through, through this illustration. So here we have, uh, Vinken and then uh, 61 years old for each one of these words, we get the contextualized word representation. And uh, here I use blue color to denote that the language model here is frozen. We just make the forward pass. Um, you know, we, we use hugging face, we load from pre-trained uh, BERT, uh, and then we don't do anything to it. We are not in the training mode. Uh, we just get the representation in a forward pass. And then we can, you know, totally forgot about BERT and just keep these uh, four representations that we are interested in. And then we have our probe, which is another model. And uh, probe is actually its parameters are changed. So here we would have input this uh, contextualized word representation, which is 768 dimensional vector for BERT. Uh, so our linear probe is just a, a vector um, a vector time, uh, excuse me, it's just a, it, it's a linear transformation. So it's a matrix of the size 768 times the number of part of speech tags we have. Uh, and that's it. Sometimes people do use, instead of a linear model, they use a one layer, a one layer multilinear perceptron. But then there, there is that question of, is this now complex enough? You know, in theory, a perceptron can learn any function. So if you are using a linear model, it's kind of safer, but then there is a question of, do we need a nonlinear transformation from a representation into these categories? So that's why this probing work has been so widely discussed in the beginning is like investigation of validity of all these claims. Okay. So that's an example of token labeling. Here is a, lab uh, and a task where you want to uh, 
segment things into chunks when you can think about the segmenting in into uh, uh, phrases that we have seen in the constituency parse three. Um, so here we would use BIO notation and then um, uh, for each one of the words, we would again get the contextualized word representation. And then the other model would predict this is a beginning of noun phrase, this is beginning of word phrase, beginning of noun phrase, inside a noun phrase, uh, and so on. Uh, for pairwise labeling, uh, here we have an example, excuse me, uh, here we are testing uh, in this previous example I just show, shown with chunking. We are interested whether the model understands the notions of spans and boundaries. And then we use chunking as a task that kind of probes into this property. So always remember that property is something slightly larger and task is just an instance, um, one way to operationalize testing that, whether the model understands that property. Um, so. Another property could be co-referential links between entities in the same sentence. Um, so given two entities in a given sentence, we just need to predict whether they are co-referent co or not. So for example, in the sentence, Obama is the former president. Here uh, we get have a slightly different way now of uh, doing our probe. And this is something last time you didn't really uh, didn't seem like you are confident about. So this is again a question of if I have two units, I have two pieces of information here, uh, word Obama and word president, how do I make a prediction, which is a binary prediction of whether they are co-referent or not? And we kind of spent some time last time to try to remember how we could do that. So a reminder that the way to do that was to, uh, was to, um, uh, you know, you you have some representations of these two words, and then you need to combine them into a single vector, because later on, all you have is a matrix multiplication. Remember, neural networks, they are always vector to matrix multiplications. So you cannot have two vectors times a matrix. That That's not a thing, right? So set of vectors times a matrix is not an operation we have ever mentioned. You always have a vector times a matrix. So you need to combine these two vectors in a single vector. Very commonly, as I said, what people do uh, in the last lecture is take the each one of these individual vectors and concatenate them together with the uh, you know, um, element-wise product of these two vectors. So this is another vectors where each value is um, a product of corresponding uh, values in these two vectors. Now you might ask why, why exactly this? Um, you know, there was a time where we had to kind of define what the good representation is, and there was a lot of like tweaking, and this kind of form was very successful for many things. And then when you develop when we would develop new neural network for a new task, which we don't do anymore because everything is a pre-trained language model, then uh, we we would just see what other people have done and this worked for other people. So it's just, you know, uh, it's something people continue to do. So now, uh, given this contextualized word representation of these two words, joint representation, we again just have a model that predicts whether these two things are correferent or not, which is a binary prediction. Similarly, for, for span labeling, uh, uh, here maybe we have a span is a global brand. Uh, and again, we uh, this is another way people would do it, uh, the, get the um, representation of a span. So uh, representation of is and brand. So first word in a span and the last word in a span. And then you do call element wise product between first and last word in a span. But here we also add the difference between the first and last uh, uh, last uh, word. Again, this is just an experimental choice. Um, you could have done this one there as well, um, wouldn't hurt you. This vector is now becoming larger. So your matrix here is also going to become larger. So there is a question of there is, is there a benefit of adding something like this? Um, you know, and the same question is here. This is something where you can do something called ablation study, where you ablate a component of your model. So you train, uh, you could train here three different versions where you concatenate is and brand. Uh, where you concatenate is brand and the element wise product and the third version is brand is uh, brand concatenate uh, element wise product and the difference 
and uh, then you compare the you know the the difference between uh, each one of these variants, and if there is no difference, then your ablation study basically says, well, uh, these these components weren't really necessary. It's kind of uh, overkill, and then you can have a simpler version of your model, which is a, a digression. Ablation is way more than you know, way more relevant than just for probing. Is there a question uh, about this? Yeah, so I'm kind of going over these to also remind you on different ways you can define a neural network from, you know, um, if you're interested in labeling spans in a text or uh, pairwise relationships between words. And it's important for me that you remember how to do this at the end of this uh, course, because as I said, even with pre-trained language models, uh, you know, uh, sure, you can approach everything to sequence to sequence, but maybe you can try these uh, simpler approaches as well. Okay, and then uh, for an, as an example of structure prediction, uh, we're going to look into dependency parse three. And uh, Hewitt and Manning here in 2019, they had a slightly different uh, approach to probing. Here, as you have seen, uh, the point was to make some kind of representation of whatever uh, input you had or are interested in, be it a span or you know two words or a single word and uh, then training a linear model uh, over it. Here they uh, wonder, is there a linear transformation of this uh, contextualized word representation vector space and there which vector distances and code parse trees? So you are mapping your you know, space, the initial space where these vectors lie in, into another space where similarity uh, between words will be associated with their distance in a parse tree. So we have mentioned that uh, verbs, for example, and um, subject and objects are in dependency parse tree, they are only one arc away from each other, right? And so in this uh, new vector space, um, the verb, subject, and object should be close uh, to, to each other. And this is kind of what we uh, uh, see here. I think the, I don't know the exact sentence, but it seems like the sentence is uh, the chef who um, run out of the store. Oh, I don't know where was comes into a plate. So I don't remember the exact sentence here, but um, the point is that, uh, yeah, ran and chef, chef is the subject of ran probably. And therefore here we have uh, the, you know, the dependency parse tree distance is only one arc away. And as we can see, these two uh, representations in a new space are close to each other. So they learn this linear transformation of the, uh, of the space. And so that means they are learning basically, again, just the uh, single matrix and but um, they are learning in the, instead of doing the cross entropy with the respect to human, you know, labels for whether, you know, like here we had a, a label, whether this is a verb phrase or not. So here you have, you're predicting into possible labels for spans and you're, you're doing cross entropy and you are training uh, uh, with the cross entropy here you are your loss is the square distance between the transform transform word vectors and the path length in the dependency parse tree. Oh, excuse me. Oh no, we went somewhere very far away. <laughs> okay. Um, and then uh, from the predicted uh, so so to to kind of um. Uh, reconstruct the parse tree from this new space, you compute the distance between each word pair using their transform vector representation. So here, for every single pair of words, we are checking what's their distance. And um, then um, you, from that, you kind of infer what the parse tree is going to be. And from the predicted parse tree, uh, you are going to compute the minimum spanning uh, trick. Okay, um, so this is just another example of how people went about doing the uh, probing for certain, uh, you know, more. Now here the property is a little bit more um, involved than just uh, whether we understand basic syntax or not. This is more complex uh, than just basic syntax. 
Okay. Uh, is this clear? Any questions about this? I remember when I first time I saw this, I was like a little bit, okay, what? <laughs> tree in a, in a vector, like you're having a hyperplane and now there's a tree. It's a little bit <laughs> wild, but um, yeah, hopefully the way I describe it is, is uh, clicks for you. Okay. <laughs> uh, all right. Hopefully, hopefully it's clear. So, uh, as I say uh, before, like uh, your in your next step, you need to decide which probing model. And probing model, as I said, have to be simple enough such that we can attribute the good performance of this probing model to the contextualized word representations and not to the capacity of the model to to solve the task. And uh, I mentioned that the linear model is a very popular one, but we have also seen one la layer uh, multi, uh, excuse me, one layer feed forward neural network or even two layer feed forward neural network. And, um, you know, it, it's basically, um, there is this tension between you want the simplicity, but also, as I said, what if you need nonlinear combination of dimensions to uh, be able to, you know, uh, retrieve a certain linguistic property. And uh, there is uh, this thing, I don't know, have you learned it in um, your deep learning or machine learning uh, classes, but it says that's the universal approximation theory that says that one uh, layer of the forward neural networks can learn any function, any mapping from inputs to outputs. It doesn't tell us what that is, if it told us we would not be doing anything what we are doing right now with neural networks because we would have explicit solution for everything. Uh, but it says in theory that's possible and maybe under very strong assumptions. So what is simple, although, you know, a single layer feed forward neural network might be simple given your huge transformer model, it might still have a lot of capacity. So this is where this tension in the community came like, um, if someone had used two layer feed forward neural network, another person in the community could say, well, I don't believe uh, this is necessarily because the model captures the notion of this complex semantic property. It could be that, you know, your model has just learned the task from the data. Uh, so we need also the data, right? If we are going to do this in a supervised fashion, and uh, from all those papers I have shown you, more studies were devoted to syntactic rather than semantic phenomena due to the available data at the time, right? So uh, more tasks had, um, at the time we didn't have a ton of uh, ta tasks devoted to semantic phenomena and that has changed with, uh, you know, um, production of uh, SNLI and NLI kind of brought a lot of uh, semantic tasks into the uh, mainstream. And then have we had a bunch of question answering tasks, uh, which we will talk um, next week. So things have changed since 2018. But remember that I also said, like, um, you need something which is very kind of, which seems simple and like, like something that seems like a building blocks for bigger applications. And with syntactic property, it's easier to make a argument that this is a simpler task that's uh, needed for whatever dumpster task. With semantic phenomena, they always, they, they very often seem uh, more complex. And then um, whether whether we have lots of data, so with cold, cold data sets, they have a lot of data points, high resource. Uh, or tasks that don't have ton of data, we call them low resource. So how much data we use is rarely uh, discussed in, in this first works. And then the question of which activations was also important for people at the time. Uh, do we do take, uh, you know, hidden activations at each layer? Do check layer wise, uh, what kind of information is encoded. And this is important. Uh, maybe some of you have taken deep learning and deep learning is prototypically uh, taught with computer vision. And then maybe you have looked a little bit into interpretability of computer vision and you learned, well, 
initially computer vision models learn something that's sort of, you know very local about pixels maybe edges and then the model learns more high level features like texture and then after texture it maybe learns segmentation or, or things like that so you can have a similar hypothesis for language, right? Uh, do lower layers learn part of speech tags and then middle layer learns syntactic parse trees. And then after uh, that, we have higher levels learning for reference uh, links, right? This is how I presented things to you as well. We have seen that, you know, semantic role labeling and for reference resolution, this semantic phenomena do can be to some extent derived from syntactic phenomena, such as whether something is an agent uh, of an uh, action in semantic role labeling could to some extent be connected to subject verb relations. Uh, some people also looked at the scalar mix of hidden activations uh, at each layer. So you, you maybe in the end you are interested uh, whether on a whole model, level the model captures this uh, phenomena so you average all the uh, uh, hidden uh, uh, representations here on the slide i have used the terminology hidden activations but by, by that i mean representations the representations of the um of uh, words or tokens and and some people look at only activations or representations at the final layer because those are then used for the uh, model whenever it's actually doing something like question answering or summarization. Okay, are these different choices clear to you? Why would you use, you know, uh, why would you use these? Okay, hopefully. Can someone just say something to make sure that we are all still on? Yeah, yes, we can go ahead. All right, thank you. Appreciate that. Okay, so you might also be wondering what is a good performance, right? Like, what does it mean? What, at which threshold do we agree that, okay, now the uh, property is captured in the representation? So current, uh, I mean, approach at the time and, and to this day is that you compare it to the state of the art when possible. So, for example, if you have whenever, whenever that's possible and it's not always possible. So, for example, for part of speech tagging, you use Pentry Bank and you have train test splits and then you check whether, you know, uh, what's your performance on, uh, on the test set and what's the performance of a model that's designed for part of speech tagging, right? Um, the best possible model you can design for part of speech tagging. And then if the performance is similar, you can say, well, um, yeah, that's a good indication that um, this notion uh, of part of speech tag or part of speech is captured in representation when I can retrieve it with uh, as good of accuracy as the model that's specialized to learn part of speech tags. And you can see how here, whether the probe is simple or not becomes really relevant. Uh, otherwise, if we don't really have state of the art, then we use our intuition. So, uh, you know, it, and it's it's very often very strange, to be honest, uh, when we have very high 90% performance, we say, well, the representation is predictive of the part of speech tag or, you know, I'm using part of speech to as an example, you can it can be whatever else you're interested in. If we have this 80 to 90 range, well, maybe it's predictive it's like we are optimistic and then when it's under 80 we would say well then we don't really know but these are quite arbitrary right so you know um it's it's really then hard to to say much which is again limitation of the probing paradigm um so and you know fair comparisons of different la language models without retraining them is is hard and uh there is another thing you want to do, and that's comparison with random word representations. So if you're random, if the model can learn the task, your lean out probe can learn the task from uh, just random, random uh, word representations, uh, that means that it really has good capacity to learn the task without actually needing 
a contextualized word representation to to capture it. So that's a good way to check also to do a soundness check of your probe, whether it's simple uh, enough. Uh, now I realize maybe I skimmed through this point a bit too fast. What is meant here is um, if we want to say, well, we are comparing BERT base with T5 large. BERT base has, um, has um, I think, 100 something uh, million parameters and T5 large has 770 million. So their representation, I don't know what the exact numbers, but um, T5's representations are likely larger than um, BERTs, let's say 1,000 dimensional versus 700 and something dimensional. And then if you want to say, well, um, you know, um, T5 captures more information than BERT, um, you would like to compare the exact, you know, like vectors that are of exactly the same size that have been pre-treated with the same data uh, and so on, because um, uh, then uh, a lot of these things could be attributed uh, to, you know, you can't tell why exactly one captures more part of speech tagging than the other if you have five things that are different between them, except like one thing that's different between them. Okay, so uh, this question of how to firmly attribute probing performance to contextualize word representation and not to probing models capacity, and what is the influence of probing training and test data size over, uh, I mean, big questions. And to this day, you know, uh, research on really, um, reliable probing techniques uh, continue. Uh, however, th this is something that has been proposed at the time and that is uh, really simple. So um, uh, uh, in this work by Hewitt and Leong, they proposed this so-called control task, task that can't have been learned a priori by representation, uh, but can be learned by the probe through memorization. Uh, so they kind of split this uh, through two things. Structure, the output for a word token is a deterministic function of the word type. The probe itself can learn the task. So here um, um, you can imagine, let's say we have part of speech tagging and uh, uh, to every verb, you, instead of saying this is a, this is a verb you say uh, in your data, you randomly shuffle it and say every word now will have be assigned to noun and uh, every noun will be assigned to adjective and something else. And then uh, you see whether the model can still uh, learn that. And uh, the other, the, the randomness, the output for each word types is sampled and dependently uh, at random. So no representation can learn this task a priori, because if you scramble the lab labels, there is, this is not a notion that was useful for pre-training. So there is no reason this should be captured. Um, so, um, yeah, so here we have how, you know, what you want to achieve. You, sh you want to achieve that, that uh, uh, um, uh, this, uh, this gap over here, high accuracy and high sensitivity, but let me, uh, uh, let me uh, go over this uh, one, one by one. Um, <coughs> let me just drink a water. So um, here, accuracy means accuracy of the probe, the, the same accuracy we were looking at before when I mentioned what is a good probe performance. And I said, well, over 90 seems to be good. 80 to 90 is kind of, I don't know, probably good. And then below 80, I said kind of arbitrarily that that's uh, inconclusive. So that's, that's accuracy still. Um, Accuracy here refers to probing accuracy. Um, and then selectivity, that's the difference between the probe's accuracy uh, minus its accuracy on this control uh, task. So the model, the probe should be really bad at this control task because uh, remember the control task is the, um, is the uh, task where we have this ran random assignment of the labels. So, no 
contextualized word representation should be able to capture random assignment of labels because that's not useful for pre-training. So if the model is able to learn uh, the task that we defined ad hoc, that means it has a good capacity and uh, it's, it's even able to memorize uh, the, the labels. So you want the difference, if the probe is good, you want this difference to be large. At the same time, you want the accuracy to stay high, right? Like if we had very low, you know, accuracy and very uh, small selectivity, that's that's not good. So yeah, uh, so here, uh, you, you, the difference between these two things should be large and the uh, and which is kind of denoted with this bar over here. This is the model's performance on this, uh, task where the labels are scrambled. So selectivity is the bar over here. You want selectivity to, to be high and you want your accuracy to stay high. So uh, in this paper, they show, well, okay, with the multilinear per perceptron, which is the same thing as the fee forward neural network with multiple layers, it seems like, um, yeah, we, when we have um, uh, already, I, I would say for me, this is even better here where we have four, four, uh, for layers, we can achieve very high accuracy of the probe without having the uh, very good ability to uh, do the task where the labels are scrambled. Okay, so this was maybe a little bit confusing, so I want to stop and make sure this is also clear. All right, so... Uh, <clears throat> Um, the point here, so this is one example where we take our probing paradigm and then we try to make sure that the conclusions we are getting are reliable. And this is just one of the proposal. A lot of probing literature from 2022 to today is making sure that the conclusions about probing are valid. So if you want to find the best probe, I don't necessarily recommend that this might be the best probe to to uh, try out. Instead, you should go to ACL ontology and you should check, uh, you should search for probing and you should do a little bit of literature review to see what is the last thing people in this space are talking about now in 2024 uh, and what makes the, the most sense uh, even next year, 2025, when you want to do some kind of a probe, you should continuously check what's the best proposal uh, for these kinds of things. Um, and you will uh, find newer proposals. All right. Um, so, uh, okay, I will stop here. This uh, this thing go goes uh, uh, into some other topics. So uh, let me just go over one more thing in terms of probing. I don't have, um, let me exit this. Um, okay. so. Everything we talked about right now uh, about probing uh, captures whether the um, whether the notion of something is captured in the representation. Uh, when we talk about interpretability, why a model had um, you know predicted which information was important for a model to make a prediction, let's say sentiment classification, and we want to check whether. Uh, we know that adjectives are important for sentiment classification. And now we want to test whether part of speech tags are important for this model, like birth, that was trained just to do sentiment classification. And we take the representations and we do the probe. Now, can you tell me what the issue might be with um, with the probes as a way of telling whether... Um, whether certain linguistic information was important for the model's decision making. So probing tells us whether part of speech is uh, captured in the representation and what's the limit of that for saying it's important for um, for the decision making. Does anything come to your mind? I'm looking for something really specific here, but I also want to ask you a question to hear you.
Well, isn't the decision ma making determined by the other weights in the model besides the embedding? Yeah, it is determined by the other weights. And I guess then the consequence is uh, just because something is captured during the representation doesn't mean it's really used, right? Like, for example, this comes often with when we talk about um, the fact that the models capture biases in their uh, representations. So just because the model captures the uh, prejudiced uh, associations in the representations doesn't mean that it's necessarily model using them for decision making, although there is evidence they are using it. So uh, just because part of speech tagging or whatever coreference uh, links are uh, the notion of that is captured in the representation doesn't mean that that information is also used by the model downstream. And this is something amnesic probing uh, is uh, is testing. It's a it's an extension of probe that tells us whether the um, the um, the the information is actually used or not. And the way they do that is by doing this so-called contrafactual interventions, where you say, okay, it uh, this uh, this probe tells me that uh, the information about part of speech has been used. Let me use a technique that deletes information about part of speech tags from the representation. There are ways to do that. Um, uh, it, the, the, a slight digression, but there is a, I kind of go back and forth between mentioning these uh, uh, biases. There is a whole line of work that aims to erase uh, biases from the vector representations. Uh, that's sometimes also called denoising or debiasing. And so you can use those methods for doing that here. And you, you can use them and uh, remove a part of speech information from the vector representation. And then you can see how well does your model perform uh, when uh, that information is uh, removed. And if your model is still performing well, that means, okay, this part tells me that the information about part of speech tagging is actually encoded in the representations, but the fact that I can remove it and still do the end task well, whatever that end task is, let's say sentiment classification, means that it's not really used for the model's decision making. Okay, is that idea clear? So if you want to, it, it really depends why are you doing probing, but if you are tr doing probing to explain the model's behavior, then you should use this approach, which is called amnesic probing. If you're just interested whether the information is there, but it's encoded, then the standard probing that I've described will be sufficient. Okay, so um, with all of that, I want to finish on two, with two things. First thing is I want to finish with this uh, Bert rediscovered the classical NLP pipeline. So this kind of, a, uh, uh, um, um, excuse me, um, probing approaches have been used in this paper to test whether uh, we, uh, BERT uh, encodes part of speech tagging, parsing, named entity recognition, semantic roles, then coreference, the things we have talked in the past weeks. And I mean, the title spoils it, so you know what's coming next. But basically, when they use this uh, probing and whatever version of it uh, they are using, and here they they uh, they have very a slightly complex way of uh, representing it. Uh, the outcome of this paper is that yes, these uh, probes do suggest that uh, this information has been uh, captured in the in the uh, in bird. So in a way, the bird is implicitly um, capturing all the uh, you know properties that we have talked about to some extent, not to the perfect extent, and um, therefore you can explain why these models um, you know perform well by saying, well, they are doing what's expected. They are looking into the same kind of features that we have been designing before neural models became a thing, they just learn implicitly to do that from this, you know, hypothesis that I have started with here by, you know, doing the language modeling or mask language modeling, it turned out to be able to predict what the next word or what the missing word is, you, the model needed to learn all these features. So model needed to learn the uh, grammatical categories, the uh, syntactic structure, coreference links, named entities to be able to do prediction of the next token. 
and uh, it encoded these linguistic properties in in its uh, you know uh, representations. And then uh, when we do fine tuning, we already have an excellent point. It's almost like every, those massively designed uh, handcrafted features are already implicitly encoded uh, in the representations. Um, yeah, I, any questions about that? I think that's kind of uh, cool, right? Because it's not like, um, it, it, it's nice to see that the models are still doing something that's similar to human language uh, processing, right? It's, it's uh, it, this information is still quite relevant. And, you know, other, other kind of a side of this is, you know, when I told you uh, whether, um, whether model understands and reason, this is also a soundness check because the language is structured. So if, uh, you know, structure was unimportant to, to a model, then, then something very wrong would be uh, happening. And this is a soundness check as, as well to say, well, uh, okay, to some extent, these models can understand the structure of language, although not to a full extent. I didn't talk about compositionality. The models are still struggling with that. Um, and and uh, that kind of gives us, we are optimistic about uh, their uh, reasoning abilities and, uh, you know, understanding of meaning. Otherwise, we would be more pessimistic than some are today. Okay, so with few, these few last moments, I want to also uh, 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 spotlight these few papers over here. So um, we have... Um, look into probing by probing vector representations. And when people tell you probing in NLP, they mean inspecting representations and what's going on with them. And, uh, you know, using this specific technique I have just covered. Um, these papers are not probing papers. They are behavioral testing of, uh, of large language models, specifically ChatGPT here. Um, and behavioral uh, testing means that you are giving just inputs and outputs to the model. Excuse me. Giving inputs to the models, the model gives the outputs, and then you are examining inputs and outputs. And through examination of inputs and outputs, you make conclusions of whether uh, the model can do something or not. And there is this whole line of work uh, these days coming up on whether these uh, models can do the task we talked about, whether we can do constituency parsing using a uh, chat GPT without fine tuning GPT. So there is no training whatsoever. You're just seeing whether off shelf zero shot, uh, the model can do it. So uh, constituency parsing, uh, name identity recognition, uh, dependency parsing, Something we didn't talk about, abstract meaning representation. The, I didn't have time to include it, but if I had included, I would show it after semantic role labeling. It's a, it's an attempt to give a like a, a representation of a meaning of a sentence, which gives like a full coverage of uh, the meaning, uh, and um, but doesn't have an executor like semantic semantic parsing has. Um, so that's about semantics. Then um, uh, Vivek and his uh, PhD student Matre have looked into, well, um, if we want to elicit um, structures from these models without training them, we should be using cleverer inference algorithms than just beam search or whatever is our favorite, you know, inference uh, technique uh, or decoding technique. And um, um and uh, and then you can see that they can do it better than if you just use beam search. So important for these works is also, are you using the best technique to retrieve the information from ChatGPT, right? Which is like those probes where we needed a good enough probe to be able to, to retrieve it. And the, the last one is entity tracking, which is related to co-reference and discourse uh, that we talked about. We said, well, uh, when we mentioned different entities in text, we are actually having these different discourse entities, like different people that or whatever uh, and organizations and whatnot uh, in our head. And then as something is happening to these uh, entities in text, we are mentally making adding them either properties or changing their states or whatnot. And and this paper, which is a really neat paper from last year, uh, there is this uh, investigation of entity tracking in language models. 
so yeah, I just want to mention these works and how what we have learned uh, in the last couple of days is um, is still commented in the you know mainstream cutting edge uh, NLP and ACL uh, work in uh, published in top conferences. Although I'm not sure whether all these are uh, already published, some of them are still just preprints, uh, I believe. Okay, so I want to end on that note. Uh, we have a minute or two. If there are any questions, I will stay here and yeah, feel free to uh, to ask me. I hope all you all of you are doing well. And um, reminder to work on your projects, of course. I hope now you are exploring. If not, start exploring. <laughs> it's it's time. Uh, at the end of semester is approaching soon. And uh, on Wednesday, we will, unfortunately, I realized there is just too much going on and I won't uh, be able to teach remotely or record the lecture. So I shifted the schedule a little bit. You can see it on the web page when you come home because the university network hates us. Um, and so we won't have a class on uh, Wednesday in neither in person or remote. Please use that time to work on your projects. Uh, I, I really mean it when I say I expect you to now be uh, exploring. Okay, I will finish here and stay for a minute or two if anyone wants to chat with me. Thank you all.